Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for uh, taking some time out of your, I think it's Wednesday. Everything's kind of a blur. <laughs> but uh, your Wednesday morning to uh, join us. I think we've got some, some great uh, uh, panelists and uh, presenters today that are going to give you some really valuable information on what you need to know about selling and buying a business. Um, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Danny Galini and the ANCA staff for uh, their great work on the Centers for Businesses in Transition. Uh, Danny's doing an awesome job with this program, and we really appreciate uh, her support. And I wanted to thank Angela Smith, who's with SBDC, for uh, doing a great job helping us line up presenters and the services that they provide. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Saranac Lake Chamber, who's been a good partner for us in these events as well, and the Hotel Saranac staff. I would like to thank them also. I just want to acknowledge a couple people that we have with us this morning. Uh, there's Lindy Ellis, who's one of our, our county legislators in the back there. Um, Melinda Little, who's one of our village trustees. Uh, Patrick Murphy, who's also a village trustee. Uh, Brian McDonald, who's a Brighton Town Board member. And then uh, Keith, who's a president of our <coughs> Saranac Lake Chamber. Uh, I wanted to thank you guys for uh, coming and supporting our event. And so um, next, I would like to... Uh, Check my pen, sorry. Am I introducing you yet? Oh, no, I'm, so I'm introducing... Danny's going to come up and uh, give us a little bit of an overview about uh, CBIT. <coughs> Thanks, Russ. Good morning. <laughs> Did Russ introduce himself? <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> so, Russ Kenyon from the Franklin County Industrial Development Agency and also the Franklin County Local Development Corporation. Is that right? He's also one of our CBIT liaisons, which I'll just talk about in a few minutes and what that means. Uh, but we appreciate their support. Uh, they're the host of this program, and we are excited to have them as a partner. Um, just a little bit about the mission of the County of Franklin IBA, but we can just kind of get started. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how this program came to be, the Center for Businesses in Transition, and why we're here today. I promise to be very short. Um, so we, ANCA, so the Adirondack North Country Association, is an organization helping to promote and build the new economy. So we support local businesses and jobs and vibrant main streets, all sorts of great things happening throughout the North Country. Um, we work to help provide support and assistance to new economies, so outside of these extractive economies that we might be used to here um, or have had in the past to promote sustainable uh, new wealth in our communities. We do that by working in local food, local energy, and with local businesses. And I won't go through all of this because we do a lot of things that I can't remember all of them. <laughs> Uh, but about uh, a year ago, uh, we started working with organizational partners and community partners throughout the region to put together a regional economic analysis. And this was developed by the Center for Rural Entrepreneurship and identified a number of different economic sort of categories or industries that we can move forward with in our communities uh, to focus on. So craft and manufacturing, local food and value-added agriculture, as well as sustainable tourism were highlighted as some of the ways in which, we, in which the North Country could really sort of move forward into, into the new economy. But out of that report, um, we realized that we were facing a problem that a lot of rural areas are facing throughout the United States. Um, so it is a national problem that we have lots and lots of retiring business owners. There are a lot of baby boomers. Um, and in our region alone, that report showed that maybe over 10,000 businesses in the Adirondack North Country may be looking to retire, you know, maybe not tomorrow, uh, but in the next, you know, 10-ish years. I say that in a very sort of vague way because some people don't retire until they're in their 80s nowadays. So you never know when your folks are ready, but they're in that baby boomer generation. So the Center for Businesses in Transition is not a physical location. It's a dynamic, evolving partnership between organizations all throughout the North Country who are working in their communities uh, to be able to address this issue. They've been doing things for years, um, and wonderful things in their community to talk about retiring business owners or just talk about trying to involve new entrepreneurs in their economy. Uh, but we've put together all of those wonderful things that were already happening into a coalition to share best practices and to share resources. So we work on matchmaking services with potential buyers, access to planning tools, connection with existing <coughs> services. And these folks uh, represented here have community liaisons in their office um, who are working every month on this topic, participating in phone calls, hosting events like this, um, and doing office hours specific for retiring business owners or interested entrepreneurs taking over an existing business. Some of these folks 
are really focused on boots on the ground work, which is getting out there, talking about what's going on, um, and making sure that people understand that the resources are available. And others, like the SDBC and Cornell Cooperative Extension, are providing more technical services. So really helping people to work through their succession plan, um, to look at their books, to look at the valuation of your business, to really talk about those sort of nitty-gritty business details. We talk about uh, different types of business transitions. Oh, sorry. Businesses looking to sell the off the market, intergenerational family transitions, and conversions to employee ownership or worker ownership. So not just not just those selling, although today's program is focused on those selling. Um, and we help people to explore their options. We're looking for business owners looking to retire or transfer ownership if you need help navigating available resources, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you're an aspiring entrepreneur looking to purchase an existing business, uh, start a new career path, or find out more about employee ownership. In 2019, we have a series of workshops. All of the workshops that have already happened or will happen will also be online, so you can access anything afterwards if you miss it. Small business owners often do not have the time to come out and drive an hour to an event and then drive an hour home, and that's a lot to ask. So everything's recorded um, so that we can share it with folks afterwards. The next one coming up is the transitioning to employee ownership or working or worker ownership. That will be June 5th at the Adirondack Experience Museum if you are interested in joining us. We're also sponsoring and supporting a number of other programs throughout the region, including a farm transition program. Uh, there's two. Uh, there's a wonderful valuation program um, that the SBBC sponsored that's now available online with an expert who came in, Peter Pappas, uh, about business valuation. And those there's two separate um, programs that he did that are available online. He just really got into the nitty gritty of what it what it's like to value your business, what you should and shouldn't do. Lots of questions to ask yourself. And I Highly recommend that you check those videos out if you haven't already. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find those at the <clears throat> on our website, which should be in all of your paperwork. And uh, we're also doing some family transition programming and exploring the idea of peer to peer groups with that, which is to be uh, discovered. So we're also doing case studies about folks who have transitioned successfully throughout the North Country so that you can learn who did they use for an account? Who did they reach out to? Did they talk to the SBDC? What? How did they end up doing the sale? And they're really easy, two-page papers. It's not a complicated thing. Um, and one of the examples is actually in your packet as well. Uh, it's the Pines Restaurant. We'll hear a little bit more about that from our French for this morning. And uh, But you can see that we'll have a number of those case studies done throughout the region. We're also, one of the things that comes up a lot with folks, and I'll talk about this very briefly, um, if you're interested in contacting us and talking about how we can help you, we know that a lot of folks, for a lot of very valid reasons, are not ready to say, oh, my business, I'm ready to transition, I'm ready to retire, and I'm ready for everyone to know about it. Because our region spans the 14 northernmost counties in New York, one of the nice things is we can talk about some of your businesses a little more anonymously. We can say something like, there's a restaurant somewhere in the North Country that has about six employees. Are you interested in looking into that to an aspiring entrepreneur? Um, so, without saying that it's you know Joe's Chicken Shack on Indian Lake. So we can sort of talk about your business without having to be that specific, so that opens up opportunities for you um, to be able to sort of connect with somebody that you that you might not be ready to connect to <coughs> that publicly. Um, and if you are already publicly for sale, uh, we will, if we have time at the end of the program, I will go over some of the sort of opportunities that I've been talking about throughout the region and give you an idea of how I talk about that. So we do sort of a storytelling approach to business owners who are transitioning and talk about the people that own the businesses, why they're transitioning, what that looks like. Um, so it's a little bit more of a telling the story of the people versus a real estate agent kind of thing. So I would love for us to get started on the panelists. No one wants to hear me talk. Um, <laughs> we want to hear from folks who are actually doing this or have done it. Um, so I will stand here for a minute as we go through the introductions, but um, Patrick Murphy, our moderator today, is coming from us with, from the Saranac Lake Area Chamber. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and we are, I, I think Russ has a little bit of a more introduction for him here. Yeah? <laughs> I realized I wasn't supposed to do that part, and I just jumped in. <laughs> That's all right. You stole my thunder, but uh, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, someone who's, who's been a friend and a colleague for the last three years that I've been here, uh, from the Wild Center to the Village Trustee, and now he's the director of the Saranac Lake Chamber of Commerce. He's been an 
excellent partner and supporter of our work in the community, and I'm really proud to have him here. Uh, and he will be uh, our moderator for our panel this morning. Thanks, Russ. Thank you very much, and uh, I think that's enough talking about me. I want to get to know some more about uh, our panelists here. We have Keith Braun and Brian McDonald from uh, Max Canoe Livery and the Adirondack Watershed Alliance and, and Lake Clear, New York. We have Christopher Beebe, who is uh, from the Pines Restaurant in Malone, New York. And we have Bill Walton from the Cascade Inn and also experienced outdoors in Lake Placid. And <clears throat> they're all uh, and have gone through various stages of transition. And I just kind of want to open it up to the panelists first to kind of just get um, the, a general story of how you guys got to where you are now. and. And, and, and kind of what made you kind of get connected to transitioning your business or getting into a transition? Let's start over here with, with, with Keith. Let me start. You want to start? Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, I'll be nice. He's sitting right next to me. Um, my name's uh, Keith Braun. Uh, like Patrick said, I'm uh, partnered here with Brian um, in transitioning uh, Max Canoe Livery uh, from, from Brian to me, essentially. Uh, we, uh, Brian and I met several years ago. We were both working at Paul Smith's College uh, at the time. And uh, when I first met Brian, I never thought in a million years I would be sitting here. Um, but in fact, uh, I did move to the Adirondacks about 10 years ago with the intention of making a living outdoors um, and didn't really know uh, quite what that was gonna look like. And after spending all sorts of time uh, in a couple of different professional roles, um, uh, heard word on the street that Maybe Brian was looking to transition his business uh, to somebody, so I, I raised my hand, and that's kind of where we're at today, in a nutshell. So, my name is Brian McDonald. I came to the Adirondacks 40 years ago. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> and uh, with the Boy Scouts, and I uh, was involved in starting a program called the Voyager Program, which we're going to do a presentation on during Celebrate Paddling Month. Uh, and... Uh, I was going to Ohio State, the Ohio State University at the time, and I spent my summers up here in uh, the Adirondacks. And when I was about to graduate uh, from Ohio State, I decided that it was would be if I was going to start an outdoor business, that was the time to start an outdoor business. So I uh, literally graduated on Friday and moved to the Adirondacks on Monday, and uh, I've been doing my outdoor business uh, in a variety of different iterations for the past almost 40 years and we um, uh, it's you know I've had three different canoe livery type businesses and we tried with just a small operation and then I had a, a guide service and then we got really big for a while I had 15 guides working for me we had a big outfitting business and then uh, I met a beautiful woman named Grace McDonald or actually her name was Grace Michelin and uh, we bought a place out in Lake Clear, and we wanted to have a couple of kids and, and uh, live the dream. And so we bought a place out in Lake Clear, and uh, we have been doing that for almost 30 years. And um, so it's, you know, it, you know, you go through transitions. We've had, uh, we, Grace and I always talked about our lifestyle business, and we always had lifestyle in quotes. You know, because as we were, as the business was maturing and as our kids were growing up, it was, you know, it was, a, it was, there were a lot of fun times, but then there were a lot of, a lot of, you know, challenging times as we, uh, as we developed the business. And we kind of followed the, you know, the, the kind of the, the ways that people were doing, um, you know, doing the outfitting and doing the canoe kayaking and, and whatnot. And we kind of stayed on the track of, of staying with canoes. And uh, we really got into promoting races. And so we had a, a real nice variety of different things that we were doing. It kind of kept our interest, but also kept the business fairly stable. Um, so over the last couple of years, our kids have all grown and unfortunately moved away. And um, so Grace and I have been talking about, you know, life in general. And, and I've been kind of looking for someone like Keith for probably five years. And I've been fortunate enough to uh, really um, have him get very interested in the position and in, in, in working with us. And so uh, we're going to talk to, talk about that today. But basically, we set up a, a sweat equity scenario where Keith is working with me for two years, and we'll do the transition. And uh, he's going to be my boss this this summer, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Chris. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Chris. Um, I 
born and raised in Malone, New York. Um, when I was about 14 years old, I kind of got involved in uh, working in restaurants around the community. Um, I ended up going to SUNY Potsdam, uh, graduating, and shortly after graduating, I made the decision that I wanted to follow my passion in cooking. Um, so I moved to Florida, got a few jobs for a catering company, um, doing some big time things, uh, decided that that wasn't enough for me, uh, made a decision to pack my car, uh, kind of like you said, you graduated on a Friday, moved on a Monday. Uh, I came home on a Thursday and the next Tuesday afternoon, my car was packed full and I was driving to Boulder, Colorado to attend the uh, Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Um, I spent 10 months there in an accelerated program, um, had an opportunity to go to Europe, uh, went to Europe for four months, worked in three different restaurants over there, uh, got some really cool experience. Um, Came back to the United States uh, and went uh, to Miami, uh, followed my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, she's now my fiance, um, and uh, spent a couple years there working in uh, a farm to table style restaurant focused on a lot of local products, um, uh, working with local farmers, um, and uh, for, in a matter of eight months I transitioned from uh, just kind of being a line cook to uh, being the executive chef. And uh, got a lot of really good experience um, in the whole farm to table scene, um, working with local people, using a lot of fresh local products. And after a little bit of time there, I just kind of made the decision that it's tough work working in a restaurant, a lot of hours, but if I was going to do it, I wanted to do it for myself. Um, so me and my fiance kind of came up with a game plan to start saving for a business. Um, and my mother, uh, who was still living in Malone, um, kind of got uh, interconnected with an uh, uh, individual who owned the Pines. Uh, it was a bar um, for the past 30 years or so. She got interconnected with the lady who owns it. Um, they were looking to kind of transition uh, out of the business because they had also three other businesses around the Malone area, a painting business, they ran a couple rentals, uh, housing rentals and things like that. And uh, we just kind of started talking about my dream and my vision to own my own establishment. And uh, we just, I mean, in, in short terms, we made it happen. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we uh, ended up taking over. Uh, we originally planned on August of uh, this past summer that just passed, um, with all the things that kind of got put on hold, we ended up making the transition uh, late January, early February of this past year, um, and uh, yeah, we've been we've been there ever since, so that's a little bit about it. Thanks, Maurice. Yeah. How about you, Bill? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Bill Walton. Um, so my uh, short version of the long story, because it is a long <laughs> one, uh, I came from Syracuse. I moved to the Adirondacks eight years ago for a lifestyle change, just like many of these guys. Um, however, I took a job in corporate development for Orta. Uh, and uh, so I was working for Orta uh, in sponsorships, local trades, and stuff like that. Got to know the area really well, and I always had this will to start my own business. Um, so I started guiding. I was whitewater raft guiding, hiking guiding, all sorts of guiding, and, that, and I thought that might have been my business avenue. Well, I kept rolling with that that idea, and it barrel rolled, and turned into team building, and then zip lining. No zip lining courses around here, so that's how I started Experience Outdoors. It took me uh, four years to write the business plan, and I ended up leaving Orta on a on a chance that this might happen. Um, in April of 2016, I still didn't have an investor. I had a contract for <laughs> I had a contract for um, to rent land and still no money with a contract, and I had a negative bank account. Um, uh, May, first week in May, um, my sister's like, hey, why don't you call my, my friend and see if he has an interest to help you out, or if he wanted to do this out in Oregon. I call him, fly him out the next weekend, we shook hands that weekend, and I was rolling by the third week of May already. Um, so that was experience outdoors, and then from there, over the last, now it's been three and a half years. I, Joe Warren in the Cascade Inn, he's been a friend of mine for eight years. Um, kind of took me under my wing because I didn't know anyone up here. Uh, 
and has been kind of like a father figure over the last five at least. And we, he always used to joke about selling the place. And I said, well, you know, that's not a bad idea, but you do such a good job. Like, you know, you do it great. And um, he's like, well, why don't you buy this place? And I said, yeah, right, Joe. Like, I'm not getting in the hospitality business. I've done, I had 18 years experience in it. I was assistant restaurant manager at one point and um, worked in SU for campus catering. I was a catering manager, so on and so forth. But uh, about two years ago, I was like, you know what? I'm interested, Joe. And the reason why I, I was so interested is because over the last two years, with Experience Outdoors, we do a lot of groups. So I started throwing feelers out there to these guys. Hey, do you guys want to do food and beverage? How about stay and play? Do you, do you have any interest in this kind of thing? So I started selling um, catered packages with, uh, and then I would just uh, contract that out to any kind of restaurant in town that they liked. Um, so I felt with the two companies being right across the street from each other, now with motels, restaurants, catering, it's kind of a no-brainer with Synergy. Um, so that's how that whole transition happened um, for me. So that's the short version of, of my story. But well, I always find it really interesting to hear everyone's individual path and journey, and yeah. and to see you know the types of folks who find it really interesting to settle and, and put down roots here, and uh, just to find everyone's individual path is always really exciting to see that. And I think it says a lot about our area, about the type of folks that are being able to that we're able to attract. Keith, could you, could you just talk a little bit more about how, uh, what was the process like for you when you started to actually know that there was an opportunity out there with Brian, and how did that connection form for you? Uh, oh, I think Brian was really lucky because at the time I was ready to uh, quit my job. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, really, once that first thing hit the paper, it was, see you later, but uh, fortunately he was, uh, helpful and encouraging me to stay longer than I probably wanted to, um, knowing full well that this transition was going to be uh, long, and it was probably going to be some time before I saw something that looked like a regular paycheck. Um, uh, so that was good, but um, when I, sorry, I, I got off on a tangent. That's all right. So when, this, when, the, when the process started, I was working at uh, Paul Smith. I was the director of admissions at Paul Smith, and I worked there for almost a decade. Um, and I had spent a lot of time traveling. I had spent a lot of time um, doing all sorts of different, really odd jobs and things I never thought I would be doing. Uh, so when this transition started, I kind of got in my head of uh, I was going to be able to ditch the suit and I was just going to canoe all day. And uh, that was how it was going to go. And uh, when, I, when I think about what I wish somebody would have told me before was that uh, that was actually going to be very little of what I ended up doing, right? And uh, I think that's, when, when you're thinking about what would I tell somebody coming in is that, sure, there's all sorts of different perks to it, um, but maybe they aren't uh, as readily available as you might think. Um, that's, that's where I was when this started. Um, I also have two uh, little kids. I have two kids under three um, and a very patient wife, um, which is <laughs> all good things to have during this. Um, uh, process, but you know, Brian and I, I think did a really good job of kind of being upfront with each other of of where we were and what our interests were going forward. And I think that's given us uh, a really good opportunity to work together to develop a business that uh, is going to be in the long run sustainable for me, but but really for both of us, um, since Brian's and Brian and Grace have invested so much over time as well. So I think that was uh, you know kind of where we started, just being upfront with each other, and then. Uh, help this plan play out uh, much better. So what would be the th that one thing that you know now <laughs> that you wish you had known at the beginning of the process? Oh. Stumped you, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, like Bill said, find uh, maybe find money earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wish I would have known that, uh, you know, those bills still exist um, through this. But, but I think, you know, I... I don't know, it, it was, it's not any kind of epiphany or anything, but I think just being, uh, you know, being upfront and honest and opening a line of communication with, you know, whoever you're going through this transition <coughs> with, um, probably could have started earlier. Um, you know, Brian and I, I, I'm not, I shouldn't speak for him. I, uh, it's okay. 
<laughs> I'm rarely the first person to make the phone call, right? I'm, I wasn't the one to say, let's sit down and talk about this. Um, my wife always does that for me, so uh, it's helpful. Uh, but I think I would have would have started the conversation a little bit earlier saying, let's, let's get this all on the table right now, mm-hmm. yeah. um, as opposed to over, you know, the last year and a half or two years, um, finding out about things, you know, coming up and then we have to address them. It would have been just better to have a, a list up front. Of things. Well, it is a really big decision. And Brian was saying that he's lived up here for 40 years. He has his business for 30 years. He has his whole family and life tied up into this business. That's a real big emotional decision for you to, to think about what you want um, um, as a lifestyle moving forward and, and, and how you want to transition out of that. How, what, what kind of made you um, get to that big emotional decision to, to you know. <laughs> what got you there? No, so uh, several things. I mean, you know, the first thing is, you know, you, you invested in a business and you've done a lot of different things. And, and, you know, you're right. I mean, we have, between Grace and I, we've invested a lot into the business and, and growing, you know, having, growing the family and, and doing the whole thing. And, and you have relationships with, with long-standing clients. And we have, you know, we're on our third generation of some families that are coming back and renting canoes or taking guided trips with us. And so uh, it was really important to find somebody that had that, those same kind of attributes that you, you know, like to project uh, that you have in a business. Um, but it's also, um, you know, you, you know, it's, you know, you're a big part of this is selling yourself. And so um, from the standpoint of our guide service, canoe livery, you know, one of our taglines is, you know, your vacation is our business. And so finding a person that has that kind of an attitude and that kind of a, you know, um, you know customer service uh, at- attitude is really important. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those scenarios where we purposely kept the business at a, at a workable level so that we didn't have to hire a lot of staff. You know, we had, you know, we've always had, you know, one or two employees or family members that have been involved in the, in the business. And we've, you know, for, you know, for the last, ever since we've had the ma- our max delivery in Lake Clear, we've always kept it, you know, fairly tight with a couple of couple of summer employees and family. So, uh, with Keith coming along, uh, it's been great, you know, to have, you know, to to see his values and to see, you know, where he wants to take the business and what we what we're doing over the over last year and this year is we're actually kind of reforming the business around where, where Keith wants to take it in the future. Because that's, to me, that's what, you know, as, a, as, as the almost former business owner, you know, if, I want to see him successful. And I want to see him grow the business to the way that, you know, he wants to project what he, you know, because I, you know, the, Saranac Lake is changing. I mean, the, the, the tourism dynamic is changing. And so, you know, with the, um, you know, for, for an outdoor business to stay relevant, and to stay, um, you know, in the game, there are certain things that you, know, you need to adapt to make it work. And Keith is bringing that to the business. Well, it sounds like there was a lot of a courtship that happened where you're trying to align and find someone that projects the same type of values that you had invested into the yeah. business, but also trying to see an opportunity in someone who wants to take what you were able to create and bring it to the next level. What type of challenges did you uh, face during that during this process? Um, that, that, you, that you think, if there was one kind of challenge that, that cropped up that you'd want to share with folks here who might be interested in transitioning? Well, I think one of the things you, I guess the biggest challenge is, is figuring out uh, your product and making sure that you, you know, what you're, what you are promoting and, and marketing as your business is what's going to be relevant as, 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 um, you know, for the next generation of travelers. And so, you know, canoeing in the Adirondacks and especially in Saranac Lake, we've been promoting the paddling community in Saranac Lake for, you know, 30 plus years, you know, almost 40. And so, you know, uh, this is a great place to be in a paddling business. And I think that, uh, you know, just for the challenge of, of, you know, what do people want when they're coming up here and they're going out, and they want to go out in the woods, but they don't want to sleep on the ground. Or they want to go out in the woods, but they don't want to go in the rain. Or they want to go out in the woods, but 
you know, there better not be any bugs out there. So, you know, so, <laughs> so it's like, it's, you know, it's that whole thing of finding that balance of, you know, um, you know, we've been very fortunate in that we have offered a variety of experiences to a variety of different clientele. You know, we've done work with the North Country Association for the Visually Impaired. We've done work for colleges. We've done work for family groups. We've done work for corporate groups. So it's, and, and that's what keeps the business fresh. But it's also what's the next, you know, where, you know, what's the next um, tourism base, I guess. Yeah. And that's where Keith is, you know, Keith is very adept in all of the um, social media. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> no, and, and I'm not. <laughs> so that's one of our running jokes is like, you know, do that thing with that, or whatever you do on that face thing. So, but, you know, and it's, and it's really, and that's, and that's relevant mm -hmm. in the kind of business that we have in the, in the new clientele that we're bringing to, to the other uh, business. Well, Chris, let, let's turn to you. And, and Keith talked about maybe one thing that he might want to know. Uh, if he had known before, it might have helped him better, is about finding some, some money, some cash, and some, some funding. And, and I heard uh, that, that you might have had some trouble acquiring some funding for the timeline that you had first initially thought that you would be able to, to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. Could you just give a little insight on that and, and how you were able to work around those challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of, like you said, going Keith said you kind of wish he had some of that and kind of a list in line and kind of knew exactly what was going to be happening. Um, same thing here. Uh, we originally planned to, so I was in Miami and we had moved back at the beginning of June, uh, me and my fiance, and we were originally planning to take over August 6th of 2018. Um, we had all of our uh, applications and paperwork and everything like that uh, with, we were using uh, CECOM out of Messina um, and we had all that all set up and essentially it kind of got to the point where we had it all in and then a couple weeks later we would get more stuff back and said, oh, well, now you need to do this paper. And then we submitted that one a couple weeks later, same thing, oh, we need this new paper. Um, and so it really kept pushing our timeline back and back and back. Um, and we originally had a plan to completely go through the bank um, and have a uh, small business loan and kind of use that right away to start making major changes in the business that we wanted to make. Um, and kind of use that as our startup capital. Um, that, as we kind of progressed and kept saying, oh, well, now this needs to be done a little bit, now, now this needs to be done, we sort of started exploring other options to maybe not go that route, even though we already invested the time to, to get to that point. Um, so once we started exploring some of the other options, we kind of sat down with the previous owners and said, hey, this is the challenges that we're actively facing on a day-to-day -day basis um, as far as getting the funding. And this is a couple options of maybe how we could scratch this and get it done quicker. Um, so we ended up sitting down and had a very lengthy conversation with the previous owners, uh, me, my fiance, um, my uh, other investor who happens to be my mother. Um, and. Uh, so we all sat down and we uh, kind of came up with a game plan to not go through the bank anymore. Um, we completely cut out the bank in the process um, and we took a lot of our own invest, uh, invested money, a lot of our capital that we had been saving up. Um, I was fortunate when I was in Miami uh, in my position that uh, I had a pretty good salary and so I was just saving all of that money for my future business. And um, so when we decided to cut out the bank, we uh, ended up just kind of using our own capital that we had saved up and developed a, a basically a lease to own type scenario with the previous owners. Um, so that way, like I said, we cut out the bank completely. Um, now we have a three year goal to eventually go back to the bank and get some more money for some of the cosmetic things for the buildings and, and things like that. We want to, you know, invest in the business and make better. But, uh, but yeah, that was kind of the, the biggest thing was just the all the little minor setbacks and this paper and that paper and um, not being able to, at first we were, I was so excited, like, all right, we're gonna get this money, we're gonna have all this startup capital and it's gonna be wonderful. And then that went out the window barely, <laughs> fairly soon, as soon as we realized that that's not the road that was gonna be taken. Um, so kind of just, 
sitting down and talking with the previous owners and kind of figuring out that that, that second game plan to kind of do the least to own really mm-hmm. worked out for us. But uh, but yeah, it was it was it was a quite a bit of a process, and I wish I wish in in, in the beginning we kind of had a complete list like here do this and then everything will be fine. But you know, <laughs> that's not how it goes. And yeah. we're, we're here, we're still here doing what we're doing. So, well, it sounds like you really had a, you know, once you hit that wall, you, you kept the communication open with the, that, the current owners and your, you know, the transitioning team that, that you're with. And you, you just kept it honest about the issues that you were facing. Yeah. And that was and, one thing I'm very thankful for too, throughout the whole process, the previous owners, they were, they were very ready to get out of the business, and um, so the, the the opportunities that we presented to them, uh, I guess the second and then the third opportunity or option rather that we presented to them, kind of ended up working out. So um, I was very thankful that the communication was there, and they were they were willing to work with us. So, so you you said that you felt like you you, you wanted to go into the restaurant business, you've known you wanted to do that. How do you feel um, going into someone else's business? and making it your own? Definitely difficult. Um, Like I said, it's been an establishment for 30 years around the Malone community, uh, primarily in the past known as just a bar. Um, And one of the biggest things for me is um, knowing that I wanted to transition to a restaurant first and foremost. Um, My main concern was the, the existing clientele. Um, I didn't want to go in there and have all of these people who are regulars or that frequent the establishment often. I didn't want to scare them away that, oh, we have a new owner. He's changing all of the, all of the, the atmosphere. Um, he's changing the, the menu. Um, and it's going to be, you know, a little more expensive on the food side of things and this and that. Um, that was probably one of my biggest fears is just uh, having the existing clientele um, be scared for what I wanted to do and make my own but uh for the most part things have been working out um and people are very open and and accepting to my ideas and stuff um but but yeah just just kind of throwing them back and forth in my mind and then with my fiance with some of the other people that i i consult and talk to about um the transitioning of the business it just like i said kind of thinking about them and, and not doing anything too quickly um like, for instance, one of the main things I did was they had a lunch menu in place. Uh, at the, the previous owners had a lunch menu. They didn't do anything other than just lunch. Um, and I took probably 60% of that lunch menu, and I kept it for my first menu. The, even though I didn't really want to, but I did because, once again, I didn't want the existing clientele to look at something completely new and kind of just be like, whoa. Whoa. I wanted them to still have that comfort of knowing that there was something there that they could still enjoy and they were still welcome. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of value that they've already put into that. Exactly. And it's just to throw it out the window like that, you'd lose all that prior work mm-hmm. that they've all put into those clients that go in and, 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 and utilize them. So, right. Yeah. Bill, we talked about financing. I think financing is just a big, a big elephant in the room, right? When we're trying to think about uh, transitioning into a business. And, and you talked about some issues that you had with just – with experience outdoors and, and finding that cash on hand. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that and how you were able to work through some of those those, those issues? Yeah. Um, so I was never good with money growing up. Uh, <laughs> I came from uh, Syracuse, New York City School District. Um, I got a credit card when I, like as soon as I could, took out a cash advance, never paid it. Um, so I couldn't... <laughs> I couldn't get a loan through a bank. So that was my problem. I, there was just no no way I could get a loan through the bank. So I explored other options. I talked to the SDA for a little while. Um, I talked to friends, family. I asked every family member that I, that I knew, you know. Um, and uh, it's, tar- it's hard to mix family and business, too. But, um, and the, the SBA loan potentially could have worked for me, but the timeline for me just wasn't, wasn't work, working. Uh, I will tell you that I am very aggressive with my timelines, um, and my lawyer tells me that I'm crazy, but that's fine. Uh, but uh, so I, I just seeked. Uh, there's angel investors that I reached out to. There's some companies in, in the Adirondacks that you can uh, get support from those guys too. Um, the big part of the way I was able to find funding was my business plan. Um, both of the business plans that I wrote were very, very in depth. 
with his uh, forecasts and numbers. And I mean, I had everything uh, down to like, you know, the, the paper for the printer, you know, on there and um, was very close and accurate as, as I moved forward with those projections. Um, and I think that what has sold the two investors that I have now found, so one was my business partner for Experience Outdoors, um, who I found literally a week before I was ready to pull the plug and move out west. And uh, this new investor for the Cascade Inn, I found a month ago. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and every single dollar that I, I, I earned over this past few years, I was dumping back into either starting this new business or helping out the old business, this other business. And uh, I wasn't working. I, to me, working was trying to get these two businesses going and continuing them. So I sacrificed a job. I could have I could have worked all day, every day somewhere for construction or bartending. <coughs> but I didn't do anything. I didn't work all winter just to focus on this thing. So I was hurting. I was asking my dad for help. And the experience outdoors is not yet capable of satisfying a lifestyle yet. Um, it's too premature. So I, I took risks. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yes, there were times where I was like, wow, I'm, I'm going to, this is not going to work out all the time. Um, but I just kept pushing through and um, head down and, you know, feet forward really is what happened. It sounds like preparation is key, right? With yeah. Your, with your business yeah, plan and, and understanding what your, your, some of the different, you know, information that you put into that business plan and setting goals for yourself yeah. and, I mean, and being diligent on that. And another thing too, like I, I was doing the stuff for the cast. I was doing stuff for the Cascade and like I had already had purchased the business back in December. I already was getting websites ready. I had marketing material ready. I had... I had everything lined up way before we were ready to even close or do anything with contracts before I started this this new business or casket in. Or not started, but taking over. You, so you just kind of got to, that's those risks that I take. I just, you plan like it's going to happen and do not stop until <laughs> you, you really have to, <laughs> I you, guess. Well, you said something that I wanted to go back to, which is um, it's kind of, tough to go into business with, with family, but it could also be tough going into business with, with good friends. And you said that you're oh, yeah. good friends yeah. with your, with your, with the owners of the Cascade Inn. So what, how was that an opportunity, but also how has that proved challenging at times? Yeah. <laughs> so it's been, it's been, a, it's been great. Um, it's been very hard over the last couple weeks now. It was great all the way up until about a couple weeks ago in a sense that um, I'm changing quite a bit. Um, and Joe, the owner, he's had it for 30 years, and, and as you know, change change is hard. I mean, it's his live and breathing baby, you know, it's his business. And he's, I'm changing things that in his mind just don't need to be changed. You know, um, light fixtures, bathroom fixtures, dishwashers that all are okay, but not, not for me, not for my, not in my opinion. Um, so we have very different mindsets when it comes to actually running the business, and that's okay. We would never, we're never going to be like-minded in that. So that part of the transition and me changing paint colors and I'm changing his entrance and things like that, you know, it makes it very difficult as an owner who's now still, or a previous owner who's still living there, watching me do all this stuff, and I got a team of 10 people in there. You know, it's hard for, for someone like that, I think, and, mm -hmm. and that's where it's become difficult, um, just watching these things go and you know, throwing, going, taking loads to the dump of, of stuff that he's had. And, you know, it's just, I think that that's, that's been very difficult. Uh, have, have you had a conversation with him about it and it worked him through some, some things? That yeah, I mean, we talk about it. He, he, he understands, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's just very it's sentimental, you know, so. So I'm getting the signal here to move, to, to, to move on oh. here. So do we have, let's open it up some, to some questions. Do we have questions in the room here that, um, from, from anyone? Diane? I'd just like to start, and I think everybody kind of touched on this in this selling your business information they gave us. Um, in preparing to sell your business, it talked about um, a small business like myself uh, that would sell for under two hundred thousand dollars. It said um, you should prepare like a sheet. They're calling it a memo, the term sheet that presents little, uh, little more than a. All you really need is to present something that describes your business, gives financial information, a presentation of price and terms. Um, when it says terms, you guys all sounded like you came up with them once the business was decided that there would be some sort of a transaction happening. 
And I'm wondering, as a business without someone lined up to buy, how do you come up with terms? Is that am I thinking the right way when you say terms here? You, I can. You know, like right here, Brian, you said that Keith is working for you and working into the business, and so I'm sure you came to a decision how that would happen over how many years. Right. Um, I'm just kind of wondering how a business sits back and says, "What are my terms?" Is that just something? Yeah, it's a negotiable item. I mean, so it's, it's just, not. Yeah, it's. So I mean, it's, that's evolved. For it, you let them know it's negotiable. Yeah, that's evolved multiple times. Like I think everybody said as well is that yeah. where we started uh, isn't necessary. We're pretty close to it, but it's not necessarily where we are. Uh, you didn't come close now. to my seven million. I, yeah, <laughs> my, <laughs> my stack of cash was a little lighter than he was hoping. <laughs> I I would advise you to to not negotiate unless you absolutely have to. Just yeah. try to sell it. Yeah. yeah. Provide the financials. You provide all the information that they need and let them, you know, it's just like selling a house. You want to keep it on the market as long as you can for that price yeah. until it gets, you know, then you're ready to let it go. Then you have to come down. It's accurate. Don't, but you have it's to not be negotiable realistic. until you have, it, you have to be realistic also. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I know, like, just trying to sell a vehicle once through the newspaper, people can string you along forever. And now, if I sell one, it's like cash for a person to come to me. But then a business is a much bigger transaction, so you negotiate it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I know some of you have very interesting stories that keep related to all of them at least in some degree, but um, I know we're really talking with three buyers and one seller. <laughs> I want to be a seller. <laughs> okay, so did you? Did you just bump into him, or did you go to the SBDC, or how did you go about finding your buyer? I had an agent. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, well, Keith and I worked together for several years. You know, we we. Um, I see. Yeah. It's so it evolved. So yeah, and and basically, you know, I've been, um, I would say probably for the past five years, you know, Grace and I have talked about what are we going to do next, and so. Um, we were kind of setting up the business to be able to be sold. And, um, you know, Keith was, he, he and I had, had met and, and he was expressing that his, his original goal when he came here was to work in an outdoor business. And I was like, well, I just happen to have an outdoor business. And so, yeah, <laughs> but it was. And, uh, what he's not mentioning is that every time we spoke, he slipped a piece of paper that said, Lifestyle business for sale. It was subtle. It was subtle. Every note card. <laughs> I think, and, and, and Brian brought, brings up a good a good point that a lot of times people that you might not think might be interested in, in, in acquiring your business are clients, people that you work with as vendors, and we also have a really great resource in the room with with the Center for Businesses in Transition that you can talk to them about if there's potential people in the area. So I think. Keeping that there's a lot of resources here in the room that can help you, you know, think through some of your options. Yeah. And and another note on that is that that Brian and I did not have that conversation initially. He is being honest that he had somewhat of an agent um, who had first kind of mentioned it, put the uh, put the thought in my head. So making sure that you're connected to all these different networks and and expressing to you know folks that you keep close that this is an interest and and whatnot because it, that conversation may not have happened without that third party. Uh, person, so just you know, being involved in things like that. So. Yeah, because one thing you can't do as a business is put a big sign up front that says for sale. But you know, you, if you if you're interested in in selling, you, you know, you have to communicate some way. And so when this whole program was starting, Keith and I were like, we're so ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we brought you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's just it is. I mean, it, it is a you know you know now that we have kind of become public as far as our transition is concerned, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that have been coming to us and asking us questions. I think I had a question over uh, here. Yeah, yeah, Keith Freeman. Um, I have two questions, actually. Brian, you had mentioned that um, Keith would probably have to do some adaptations because of the changing Saranac Lake tourism. Uh, then you mentioned social media a little later on. Yep. Was there anything else besides social media um, adaptation-wise in your mind that you might have to look into. And the second question is, did any of the panelists uh, use the CBIT or the SBDC in your you know, process of 
by yourself? So I'll answer the first part. Um, the first part was about, you know, so our goal in this two-year transition is to have Keith's focus on where he wants to take the business and move the business from, you know, from where we used to do business to where Keith wants to do business. And so I'm kind of, you know, we, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about, you know, what the style of the business that he wants to that he wants to do, and projecting that in our new packaging and in our new, uh, you know, presences on websites and Facebook and, and everything else. And so um, the idea for, you know, for me is, you know, I, I mean, we've, we've done a variety of different types of guiding and, and outfitting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now that Keith is taking the helm, you know, I want to fashion it into his personality and his, where he wants to go with the business. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's that whole thing of, where, where are Keith's strengths and what does right. he want to take the Yeah, I was more curious as to your thoughts about how Saturday Night Live tourism is changing and how that delivery would have to adapt to that change in tourism. Yeah, well, uh, go ahead. Uh, well, I think, I think part of that is, um, you know, it's important to be uh, part of the destination, not exclusively the destination. I think that's right. the big difference is that people traditionally have traveled to Saranac Lake to go canoe camping for a week. Right. That's not necessarily the case anymore. They're coming for a variety of different experiences. So, mm -hmm. so changing what you offer to be uh, shorter, more digestible, mm -hmm. and able to be paired with something else. You know, as uh, as Bill was talking about, all these different packages and and the stay in plays and things like that are are really mm -hmm. desirable. Um, and also moving to better facilitate the entire experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Brian wasn't joking when talking about you know people don't want to go outside when it's raining. And really having an understanding of how to facilitate an experience for somebody who doesn't want to get wet when they're canoeing, um, it's <laughs> it's hard to do, but it's it's a real thing. I mean, it's it's uh, making sure you have waterproof cell phone cases available is important um, to folks who use a cell phone. Um, so that's yeah. that. And we're doing a big one of the things that with the Celebrate Paddling Month, the month of June, we're going to be offering a variety of uh, familiarization tours. So that local businesses that have their front line people, they can actually go on a tour. It would be like two or three hour canoe trip with us, and they can see what is in their backyard. And we're, so we're partnered with the Chamber of Commerce on offering it up to Chamber members to just come out with us for an afternoon and see what we do. So that then when, when their customers come in, they can say, this is a great thing to do. I think we're going to take a short break uh, at the moment, so you can feel free to come up and talk to our panelists if you have more questions. And I just want to thank the panelists for your time today, because I know you all are busy, and, and thanks for sharing some of your experiences. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.